I want to talk to you today about the main problem I have with New Agers, with the New Age movement, if you will. Um, and I want you, if you're a New Ager, I want you to watch this and, and consider the points I'm bringing up because I'm not against all things that New Agers stand for. I'm going to be defining some things in this study. Um, this is not going to be some wide-eyed rant about all the problems in the world are blamed on the New Agers and that the New Agers are bringing in the New World Order and all this other stuff. Uh, no, no. Um, religious people are the ones that will be bringing in the New World Order, uh, specifically the Roman Catholic Church. Organized religion, uh, the wicked abomination that it is, spoken against in the Bible, actually. A lot of people don't realize that. They try to fight organized religion by fighting against the Bible when the Bible is against organized religion. So I'm going to be showing you some of that stuff today, but um, the New Age movement has its issues, has its problems. And as we're going to talk about in the study, but I'm going to start out actually saying the things that the New Agers, a lot of people in the New Age movement, and that's I, I realize that the, the, the term New Age is kind of very, it's not really specific to any one group. Um, there's a lot of different people within the mindset of we can be enlightened and bring in a new age of enlightenment and through education, through activism, through whatever. Um, but I, I'm just saying in the broad sense here, people that a lot of times would be classified as new agers, what are things that they have right? We're going to start out the study on that. Okay. Number one, you can, if you have a Bible, King James Bible is the real one. You can turn to Genesis chapter one. The very beginning of the Bible, one of the things a lot of people in the New Age movement have right is herbalism and natural healing. Let me show you. Genesis chapter 1, what does the Bible say about herbalism? Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. Uh, and God created the earth originally to be vegetarian. A lot of people within the New Age movement are vegetarian. And there's some pros and cons to that. I understand the argument. I've been a natural health advocate for a very long time. I'm not a vegetarian. I'm not a vegan. Okay, But I do understand the benefits of grass-fed meat over factory produced meat with antibiotics and all the other growth hormones and everything else. I do understand those things. Wild harvested, um, you know, uh, wild harvested edibles uh, or organically grown fruits and vegetables uh, as opposed to genetically modified or genetically engineered types of things. Okay, and a lot of people within the New Age movement, they get it. They understand that. Um, I've known and met New Agers that understand the thing of natural health. Uh, people in organized religion a lot of times will actually mock New Agers for eating organic foods, which shows their own, their own ignorance, really. Um, next go to Psalm 104. Again, a lot of New Agers of, that I've met are woefully ignorant of what the Bible actually teaches and are quite shocked a lot of times to find that the Bible actually lines up with some of their beliefs. Psalm 104, verses 14 through 15. He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle, and herb for the service of man, that he may bring forth uh, food out of the earth, and wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengtheneth man's heart. Again, bread, real true bread, when you get into sprouted grains and lacto-fermented and all the other stuff, um, it's good for you. You go to the store and you get the white enriched bread or even the, the wheat, whole wheat enriched breads or whatever else that are made with, you know, chemical leavening processes and whatever else. Yeah, that's bad for you. And people <clears throat> point to that stuff and say, well, see, bread's bad for you. No, factory produced bread, stuff that you get in the store is bad for you. But you get a real good sourdough type of bread that's made with natural ingredients. It's quite good for you. And the Bible does not teach that all wine is bad. It says so right there, wine that maketh glad the heart of man. You can drink wine in moderation, according to the scriptures. All right. There's a lot of things people have been 
given a very, very bad taste, you know, for uh, Christianity because of organized religion, and they'll turn against this book, that's a big problem. Okay, and that is one of the problems that I do have with a lot of people in the New Age movement. They've closed their mind to what the Bible actually teaches. And they would be shocked when you actually study what the Bible really does say. <clears throat> but another thing that I've seen with people in the New Age movement, a lot of times they will be against the medical establishment. And you might be shocked to find out that the Bible is as well. Luke chapter 8. I'll show you here in the New Testament. The book of Luke. And there's, I mean, this is, there's a whole lot more I could get into. Uh, you can watch my study, God's Herbal Judgment, if you want to see the, what the Bible says about herbology and everything. It's, a, it's a, actually a gift from God to heal man. Again, we saw that there in Psalm 104. But let's see what, what uh, the Bible says about the medical establishment. Luke chapter 8, verse 43. <clears throat> And a woman having an issue of blood twelve years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any. So people out there that are New Agers, a lot of times they say, yeah, the big pharma, the big medical establishment, all that stuff, I don't want anything to do with it. Well, that's good. The Bible speaks against that stuff as well. It gives a story of a woman who had an issue of blood for twelve years, and she spent all of her living going to the physicians, and she wasn't healed of any of them. How many of you out there know of people that have gone to the medical establishment and they, they go through all the medical insurance and everything else, and they're not healed of the doctors that they go to? They're put on so many different pharmaceutical pills. And it's funny because actually the Greek word there for, for pharmacy is the same Greek word. It's translated in the King James Bible as witchcraft. So pharmakia there is the Greek word. It's translated, you know, modern word would be pharmaceutical. And in the Bible, it's, it's written out as witchcraft. Hmm. And when you understand the concoctions and the chemical things that they put together in the pharmaceutical world, uh, you'll avoid them if you have any sense. Again, like I said, a lot of people that I've met that are in the New Age movement, they understand that. They understand, hey, this pharmacy stuff, the pharmaceuticals, eh, I'm not going to take anything there and I'm going to stay away from the medical establishment, the hospitals, the doctors, whatever else. The cure is out there in nature. That's good. That's good. The Bible's not against that, you see. The Bible, that is the biblical system. You see, but I know Christians, no, you know religious people. Okay? You got to get the difference there. Right? The the one of the greatest criticisms against organized religion is actually this blessed book right here. And you preach against you preach this book, you will be preaching against organized religion if you really are preaching what's in here. But um, respect for the natural world, another one. I've seen a lot of New Agers that have a great deal of respect for, for nature. I'll show you what the Bible says in the book of Psalms. Psalm 8. Some notes over here on this shelf. That's what I'm looking over to. Psalm 8, <clears throat> verses 3 through 4. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Save man, King David writing about his relationship to God, but he, he has that relationship through nature. And he goes out and he just looks at, at nature and he, and he just stands there in awe. What is man? I'm just I'm I'm just a nothing little nobody in the in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, you realize that uh, when you get out around nature and things, you'll realize how small you are. So again, I've seen people you know that have a great deal of respect for the natural world, and they're not even religious. Proverbs chapter thirty. And like I said, I could do a whole lot more verses here that we could turn to. I could show you the, uh, the positive aspects of the New Age movement. But um, that's not really the point of this study. Proverbs chapter 30, because there's a, a rebuke that's coming up here. Um, that I, The problem that I do have with the New Agers out there. And uh, it's something that you can get fixed up. And then a lot of other stuff will make sense. We'll get to that in a little bit. 
Proverbs chapter 30, verses 24 through 28. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The cunnies are but a feeble folk, yet make they their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet go they forth all of them by bands. The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. You'll notice those little things, the little intricate parts of nature. I, I love to see videos and things on YouTube of people that just photograph a little bee flying into a flower to pollinate it, and he comes out, and I, I love to see the real high-definition things. And I, and I think when I see that, I think there's a person, and you listen to them, they don't, they don't give God the glory for any of that creation. They say Mother Earth or whatever else, but they have a respect for the creation. They have that, they can look and they can say, you know, consider the ant, consider the spider. Wow, look at this. And, and, and oh, these, these neat parts about nature. That's good. That's good. But you don't want to fall into the trap of worshiping and serving the creature more than the creator. You go to an art gallery and you see a bunch of beautiful paintings. You don't just forget the name of the artist. You go around and you look, you admire their work and you say, wow, Picasso sure was a great artist. Rembrandt was a, a great artist, uh, whatever. You know, you, you go around and you see the artist and you give the artist glory through their work. Well, that's how it's supposed to be with God. And you say, well, oh, great, then I have to go to church. Oh, my, no. Nobody in the New Testament went to church. Okay, the church is the people. You can fellowship with other Christians. That's coming together as the church. But there's not one verse of Scripture in the King James Bible that says, go to church. Again, you have to understand that. A lot of people don't get that. Matthew chapter 6. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 through 29. The Bible says here, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't really truly have an appreciation for nature and just be all about money. I'll say it that way. And you understand that if you're a new ager. You understand that if you're somebody that's, that's into nature and things like that. You can't be all about money and go out there and enjoy nature. Just the way it is. And you know, in your life as a Christian, you can't serve God and mammon. Mammon is a Bible word meaning like money, you know, the love of money. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6 is the, is the root of all evil. You get somebody that's just, just coveting everything. Just in, in um, What's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, they're, just, they're obsessed. They're obsessed with money. Um, that's a problem, especially in religion. You can't be obsessed with money and serve God. Very simple. Verse 24. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Hmm. So again, here you have the words of Jesus actually in the New Testament. And Jesus is saying, hey, you know, the Bible actually says that, you know, by Jesus, by him were all things created. So Jesus is the creator and he comes to the earth and he's saying, hey, I want you to consider what I made out here. I want you to con look at the ravens up there flying around. Look at the lilies of the field. Did you ever sit down and actually look at a flower up close? It's beautiful. It's amazing. You know, the texture and everything else and the smell and they're amazing. Did you ever look at an insect up close? Did you ever look at a, a, a whatever? I mean, you just, nature is amazing. And again, a lot of people within the New Age movement, they understand that, but they don't make the connection of, I should actually get to know the creator, the one who made everything out here. But that's not the real big problem I have with the New Age movement. We're going to get to that. Uh, another one, a sustainable agrarian life. Um, right now, I am talking to you from a tiny home 
that my wife, my son, and I built. Uh, it's not done yet. We still have a door to put on here and a bunch of other things to do. But this is a tiny home that is off-grid in northern Maine on acreage that we own. And we harvest wild edibles here. We have a lot of uh, apple trees, a lot of other wild berries in the area and, and things. And, and um, <clears throat> we are very much into the sustainable living type of movement. Now, we don't go overboard with it and whatever else and start saying that, you know, people should be forced into com compact cities and, you know, Agenda 21 type of stuff. We don't do that. But we are trying to set an example for Christians to follow. Um, so don't look at me and say, oh, well, you're just some church building modern Christian hypocrite that, you know, uh, is just an energy consumer and whatever else. I mean, we compost, we do, you know, natural food, natural health, all of that stuff. We're very, very big believers in that. And again, a lot of people within the New Age movement, they also understand these things. They believe in the thing of being sustainable, right? Uh, not building some 5,000 square foot log home that has an R value of six and then heating it with oil or something, you know, crazy and spending seven or $8,000 a year on, you know, fuel oil or something. That's not sustainable. You can't keep doing that. That's a bad idea. So you make things smaller, make things more efficient. Um, we heat this thing with wood. Right here you can see this, uh, well, I guess, you, yeah, you can kind of see the pipe angling up there. Um, I had to angle it up because originally I had a rocket stove and thermal mass in here, another story, but, you know, we heat with wood. That's sustainable. We're into that. Again, I agree with New Agers that are into the same thing. Very important. Um, and the agrarian life, the thing of uh, growing your own food, the, the permaculture movement, I, I think there's some real good stuff there. Um, you know, there's a lot of good things out there. I'm not going to go off on a big rant on that whole thing. But um, as far as this whole thing of uh, living a life where people are farming and getting along and whatever else, what does the Bible say? Well, many of you... If you know anything about the United Nations, you've already seen this. You've already heard it. Maybe you don't know where it came from. It's on the front of the United Nations building, or at least it was for a while. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4. I'm going to go skip a little bit here for a reason. It says, And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Again, a lot of people within the New Age movement would cheer that. They would say, yes, that's what we're trying to get to. Make peace and make love, not war. Let's, let's, let's not fight. Let's just, you know, uh, build a better world in our own backyard. And, and uh, you can start one person at a time. Be, be the change you want to be in the world and all this other stuff. Um, okay, that stuff is good. But the problem, and here's where the problem comes in. Let's read the actual whole verse. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And then it goes into the rest there. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. Now here's where my problem with the New Age movement comes in. Because you see, New Agers will say, we can bring it in. We can do this. We will be the change that we want to be. We will make these things through education and through activism and whatever else. They wipe out the Lord judging. That's the problem that I have. And if you understand the judgment of the Lord, you would be for it. You wouldn't say, oh yeah, yeah judgment of the Lord. Yeah, like the Pope doing this thing. The Pope and all the people that serve in the Catholic Church, they're all a bunch of devil worshipers. Okay, The Pope is a very, highly, he's a very high level Satanist. Right? And again, if you get saved and you read the Bible, you'll understand that. It's actually Mystery Babylon. The Bible calls it Revelation 17 and 18, and God's actually going to destroy that system. God needs to come here and physically judge things. You see? And New Agers, New Age philosophy, depending on which stream of it you believe in, there's some of them that say that there's an age of Aquarius that's coming, where men will, will evolve to Homo Noeticus, you know, and, and they're Homo sapiens, right now, but they'll be evolving to Homo Noeticus, the new man, the, the God man, if you will. And people will reach this level of enlightenment. Some people will say, well, it's going to be partly through an artificial intelligence coming in and doing the, the 
menial tasks of, of, that need to be done. And so then we can, you know, focus in on uh, really high level intellectual uh, pursuits and, and whatever else and we'll become God-like and things. And it's all about removing Jesus Christ from the picture. And Jesus Christ is the Lord, the Holy through the Bible. It's about Jesus Christ. Uh, he is the Lord of glory. He is God Almighty. And that's the biggest problem that I have with it. There's many things that New Agers are right in. Many things. Far more, I believe, than, than a lot of the people that go through organized religion. I've had people in organized religion make fun of natural health. I've heard them make fun of off-grid living, uh, non-electric type of stuff. You know, whatever. They make fun of that stuff. They don't know God. Okay? Those things are supported in Scripture. But what is not supported in Scripture is the New Age belief that man can bring in a kingdom. And I'm going to show you in the rest of this study that the Lord has actually set it up in a way that the earth itself is going to be restored supernaturally. The Creator Himself comes down and says, Now, I'm going to fix it up because you can't. See, that's the whole thing. The New Age movement is saying, oh boy, look at the bee die off out there because of the genetically engineered crops and because of the Wi-Fi and whatever else. Um, look at the fracking that's been done and the gas wells and, it's, and the water is getting contaminated in, in a lot of parts, a lot of states in the country. And look at the depleted uranium that's been used as ammunition over there in Iraq. And, and look at the, the Fukushima nuclear radioactive waste that they're dumping into the ocean. And look at the plastic islands, the, the islands of plastic junk that they're floating over there in the seas and whatever else. And there's whole big, huge patches of it and whatever. What are we going to do about this? And what are we going to do about that? And you think as a new ager that you can take care of it. If we just get enough scientific grants and if we just get the United Nations behind this and we need to sponsor this and we need to do this and we'll just, you know, zero impact and we'll, we'll stop getting food in plastic containers and we'll, and we'll do That's the problem that I have. Um, the Bible defends a lot of what New Agers believe, but when it comes to this point of who's going to fix the problems of this world, that's where the Bible and the New Age movement part company. Because the New Age movement says we can fix it. Man can stop this horrible stuff that's going on. And the Bible says, no, you can't. The Creator has to come back. I mean, imagine, let's go back to my analogy from earlier. You have an art gallery and somebody comes in there and they defile all those paintings. What are you going to do? Well, you're going to have to get that artist to come through there and fix those paintings because it was his mind that said, this is the way I want this painted. I want it to look like this. The artist is really the only one that can fix up that mess. Well, nature is in a mess right now. And it's going to get a lot messier in the future, by the way. Uh, all the talk of, of war and everything. There's going to be a, some really, really major world wars, including nuclear uh, things and, and, and horror and terror like the world's never seen before. And it's all being done on purpose, you see. God is judging this world. I'm going to show you the scriptures here in a little bit. God is judging, and He's going to wreck this world. And then He's going to come back, and He's going to say, Okay, now that it's wrecked, hey there, people, can you fix it up? Uh, I guess not. And the Lord's going to say, Okay, I'll fix it. Let me show you. And let me show you the scriptures. Let's look at the... First, first three verses here in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and then down into verse 4, which we read earlier. Before you can beat your sword into a plowshare and your spear and your pruning hook and, and not learn war anymore, this is what has to happen. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days, we're not there yet, but we're entering into it, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. Jesus Christ is going to set up his kingdom in Jerusalem. Physically present. God on the earth. Not, well, he sets it up through the Catholic Church and they're his representatives while they're raping children. You know, I don't think so. God sets up his kingdom on the earth, himself being here. 
physically on the earth. Verse 3, And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. He will teach us of his ways, not his religion, his church. He teaches you. And we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He's speaking. And these perverts will come along and they'll say, well, we're post-millennial. We believe that Jesus comes after this thousand years of, of peace, which is what the Bible teaches. There's a thousand years of peace where Jesus will rule on this earth and he's going to restore things. Okay, And people will say, oh, well, it's actually the church that's going to be doing this stuff. They can't read plain English. Okay, and I have a whole study on the thing of the premillennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. Verse 4, And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That comes after Jesus Christ comes to bring judgment, and not before. It's not, well, you know, we're, we're going to get together. We're going to bring the, the best minds in the, from the university, we're going to bring the best mind you know, from academia, we're going to bring the best minds from the scientific community, from the medical establishment, from the organic farming, from the, and we're going to get together. Never happened before in history, you know, everybody's always fighting and killing each other, but we're going to do it now because we've come further now. Uh, we're, you know, yeah. We're going to bring everybody together and we're going to create this great new kingdom, this great new world. And we're going to bring in this world peace thing, and it's going to be great. And, uh, yeah. Uh, well, maybe if you smoke enough dope or whatever else, maybe then it'll make sense to you. But if you have any common sense, you can look at history and say, uh, it's never worked. We need the Creator to come back. Go to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11 verses 1 through 9. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of the knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Seven spirits there. Seven spirits of God. It's talking about Jesus Christ again. Verse 3. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. You know, and, and you can be as new agey and just as nice as you want to be. And we'll just, I'm just going to have tolerance and, and respect diversity. And whatever. Again, you got to get to a point where you realize, you know, there's some really wicked people that need to be judged. And they need to be judged by a perfect standard and not by the false courts of the land where the lawyers are buddies behind the scenes and the judge and whatever else. And you got a bunch of jurors in there that don't want to be there and they're just doing what the judge tells them to do and whatever. The criminal system is, is corrupt. Okay. No, there's actually a need for a perfect judge that can't be bought or sold. And only God can do that. Verse 5, And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. A lot of uh, new versions will change this. They'll corrupt it and say it's the lion and the lamb lay down together. No, it's the wolf and the lamb. All right? And understanding the spiritual implications there uh, in the New Testament. Uh, wolves are oftentimes a you know a sheep in wolf's clothing is false Christians. And you you know there's a lot of stuff to under, understand that you aren't really going to get until you get saved. You aren't really going to understand it, comprehend it, because it's a spirit of revelation that God has to give you. But it's going to get so good at this point in time that actually the animals are going to get along together and they're going to get along with people. A little child will lead these wild animals. Normally, you know, you, you live out in a place like this and you say, you got to be careful with your, your young children because there are animals around, bears and, you know, other things. Not a whole lot here in northern Maine, but there's some things that, you know, hey, be careful about that. That big bull moose over there, you don't just go walking over to him, son. You don't just go over there and try to play with the big bull moose. Uh, 
not so good. But in the millennial kingdom, when the Creator, when Jesus Christ comes down as the Creator and He fixes everything up, people are going to get along. You can have your child, oh, there's a grizzly bear coming through the woods. Oh, good. Go ahead, honey. Go on, go on, play with the grizzly bear. How's that possible with uh, New Age Enlightenment? With New Agers being able to say, let's, let's meet together. Let's get our, our best and brightest minds together, you know, and, and, and we can make this happen. It's never going to happen that way. Only when the Creator is here on the earth are the animals going to be getting along like that with people and with each other. Verse 7. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. Poisonous snakes, in other words, it's not even going to hurt them. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And again, that's the whole point of this study. The earth is going to be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Not full of the knowledge of man. Not full of, well, centuries and centuries of the greatest philosophers. And we're going to put some Plato in here and some Socrates. And we're going to have some Darwinian evolution. And we're going to bring in some of this. And we're going to bring in some... No, no, no. Full of the knowledge of the Lord. Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Truth personified. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus Christ is the truth. He is the only one that can fix up this mess that the world is in. Not a bunch of New Agers. Even though there's a lot of well-meaning, good intentions there. Trying to empower people and trying to make people understand nutrition better and whatever else and how to heal themselves and how to respect nature and how to, you know, whatever. Not be entertained by the, the stupid nonsense of Hollywood, but rather look at the beautiful videos of nature. I respect that. I really do. But I have a problem when you don't give Jesus Christ the glory for what He created. Joel chapter 2. Show you a couple more places here in the Bible. What's going to happen? Joel chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Read about that back in Isaiah. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. Tell you more about this as we continue, but just to kind of stop for a minute, you say, well, this is environmental destruction. What's going on? It's called the Lord is coming down to cleanse the earth. The Lord is coming down with His saints and saying, okay, go on out. The Lord comes down at the judgment of the nations and sits at Jerusalem and says, okay, this is my holy mountain. And He tells His saints, I'm one of them. Anybody who's redeemed a saint is, is a saint, according to the Scriptures, not some canonized pervert from the Catholic Church you know, that was quite wicked in their life. God tells His saints, you go on out there and you bring anybody that's left to judgment, to the judgment of the nations. And then we're going to go into this thousand-year kingdom where people are getting along and that there's no more war and that's agrarian. The animals are getting along. The Lord's going to restore the earth. But before He does, He says, okay, go on out and destroy everything. Burn it all down. And I'm going to rebuild it. Now, how's man going to do that? Never going to happen. Continue. Um, verse 4, The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. We come down on horses. If you read Revelation chapter 19. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness. The people that are left after the time of God's judgment, the time of Jacob's trouble, the Bible talks about, the book of Revelation, what it's about. They're going to be scared. Oh, they're prideful. They're arrogant right now. They make fun of God. They make fun of the Bible. They'll put down Jesus Christ and mock Him. 
but uh, that's going to change. Verse 7, they shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They, and they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. These are immortal saints now. You can, you know, if I fell on a sword right now, I would definitely be wounded. <laughs> but when I come back down with the Lord Jesus Christ to bring judgment to the, to the earth, you can't kill me at that point in time. Verse 9, they shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. I'm coming to get you for judgment. If you're a new ager and you reject what I'm saying here, if you reject this book, you can reject me. I mean, I don't, it doesn't mean anything. But you reject this book, you say, ah, it's just organized religionist. Bible's just ridiculous and stupid, whatever. And you go into the time of Jacob's trouble and you somehow survive it. I'm coming back. And other people like me are coming back, and we're going to take you to judgment. And you aren't going to be hiding anywhere from us. We're going to come and get you. Verse 10, The earth shall quake before them, and the heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter His, vo his voice before His army, for His camp is very great. For He is strong that executeth His word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? And again, see the new age. Well, I think we could just kind of get things fixed up in the world. If we could just kind of get together. See, you want to avoid this stuff. You don't want to avoid Jesus Christ coming back and being mean like that. And taking people and judging them. Yeah. It's a good thing. I mean, wake up to the reality of how bad some of these companies are out there. What a company like Monsanto is trying to do what 5G and 6G is going to do to nature and to your health and my health. You have to wake up. Those people need to be judged by Almighty God. And all your little councils and little, little organizations and activism groups and whatever else, it's meaningless. When you get to the top of that stuff, it's all controlled. A lot of people don't figure it out, though. Joel chapter 3 Verse 9 through 21, I'll read a little bit more for you here. Proclaim, proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. War is the future. And check this out, look at verse 10. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. So before you get to go to the agrarian lifestyle where you're taking your sword and you're beating it into a plowshare and your spear into a pruning hook, you have to actually do the opposite. Take your farm implements right now and prepare for war. Why? Because war is on the very, very near future. War is coming into the forefront. Not just with countries, but between people. Between religions. Between economic classes. Between races. Between whatever. People are about ready to kill each other. Just like uh, the Bible said would happen. Verse 11, Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither calls thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be awakened, wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Again, he's judging there, the judgment of the nations in Jerusalem. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Study the New Testament, Matthew 27, Mark 13, Luke chapter 7, and Luke chapter 21. And it talks about when Jesus Christ comes back, the second coming, the moon and the sun and the stars are darkened. Moon and sun are darkened, stars fall from heaven, they don't give their light. So there's definite tie ins there. Verse 16 The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no stranger pass through her any more. Is Jerusalem holy right now? No, not at all. 
but it will be one day when the Lord judges. And by the way, he said, well, the Jews, God's going to judge the Jews very, very harshly. The coming time period is called the time of Jacob's trouble. He brings Jews through it. He will basically bring in the new covenant the Bible talks about. This book here has a, has a second or the other part here called the New Testament. That's not the new covenant. A lot of the new versions that come from the Vatican actually call the New Testament the New Covenant. It's not the New Covenant. The New Covenant doesn't come in until the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. Again, I have a study on that. But it's very important to understand the, these things. Judgment is coming. And it's good. It's a great thing because it's a just judge that's going to judge this earth. And then he's going to restore things. He is bringing in a really good world, which we'll talk about here as we continue. Um, but look at why he does this. Okay, he brings all this judgment. Verse 17, So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall be no strangers, or there shall no strangers pass through her anymore. Read that verse. But here's the point. The Lord is doing this. He's judging, and then he's restoring the world. Why? So that you know he's God. So that you know that man can't do it. The Lord is setting it up that way. Verse 18, And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness, for the violence against the children of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall dwell forever, and Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. The Lord dwelleth in Zion. They say, well, that's the church. The church. God is coming down to this earth. He is bringing His judgment. He's going to judge these wicked people that are messing up the earth. Again, you can go to Revelation. We're not going to go there, but I think it's Revelation chapter 10. It talks about that the Lord is going to destroy them that destroy the earth. Now, if you're a new ager and you love the earth and whatever else, and you're looking to be more green and all this other, don't you want to see the, the people that are destroying this earth, don't you want to see them destroyed? Don't you want to see judgment brought on them? You should answer yes to that if you have any sense. Zephaniah chapter 3. Zephaniah chapter 3. I'll show you another very interesting verse here. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8. Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured, devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Oh, we're going to have a one world kingdom. We're going to have one world government, and the, the new world order. You know, we're going to have this thing, the Georgia Guidestones. We're going to have a, a common language, and humanity will be united you better be real careful of that. Um, we're going to have a new age. It's going to be a new age of, of, of Aquarius. We're going to be enlightened. Uh, well, you're going to be lightened, on, you know, lighted on fire, but uh, <laughs> you're not going to be enlightened. All right. Uh, that's very important to get the difference there. Be very careful about this whole, we're going to bring together this kingdom thing. Uh, and, uh, world government is going to fix all of our problems. Yeah, but now a couple more points to make here and then we'll be done. Does the Bible ever mention a new age? The King James Bible. A lot of the new versions have changed new world to new age. But does the King James Bible ever say that? I'll show you here. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21 verse 5. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Well, there you have new. Okay? Jesus Christ makes all things new. All right? Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And verse 7. It says here that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Okay, so there you go. Jesus makes all things new, and in the ages to come. So there's your new age. <laughs> uh, that's about as close as you can get to the new age 
system in the pages of Scripture. Uh, no, the Bible does not mention New Age together in the same context that there's going to be a new age. Um, because a new age is, is anemic, it's deficient, it doesn't really fix the problems. We don't need a new age, you know, wipe out all the evil people on this earth and all that's left are, are uh, enlightened, new age, off-grid, tiny home, um, organic, whatever people, uh, you'd still have a wrecked earth. You'd still have an earth that uh, a lot of the problems can't be fixed by man. So what do you need? We well, need a new world. Okay, and the ages to come, by the way, there in Ephesians 2, 7, is just talking about like the years to come and the times to come. That's what it's talking about. It's not multiple ages coming. All right. Uh, Matthew chapter 12. Two more places to turn to here and then we'll be done. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31 and 32. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. The unpardonable sin, in other words. Um, but look at this, verse 32. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. What's Jesus Christ talking about? Well, basically, they're coming and they're attacking him. And they're saying, you're this and you're that. You're, you know, isn't this the carpenter? He's just, you know, who's this guy? Uh, you know, he's going around saying that he's God and he's just a, just a regular guy. He's a homeless Jew, whatever. And Jesus is saying, okay, you don't understand who I really am here. He is fully God. He's, you know, God manifest in the flesh. You don't get it, who I am. But I can understand that. I'll, I'll forgive that. But if you're saying that there's a devil spirit in me that's speaking, um, there was no fleshly nature to Jesus Christ in terms of, oops, I shouldn't have said that, that was kind of sin or whatever. He was in full communion all the time with the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost is inside of him. So he's saying there in context, I didn't read the verses up above, but they're saying you have a devil spirit. And Jesus is saying, you better be careful about that. Um, you can speak against me but don't speak against the Holy Ghost within me in this world where he is physically walking around or in the world to come, the millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ when he is physically on the earth. See, right now, people are ignorant. You're ignorant, most of you out there. If you're a new ager, you're ignorant about who Jesus Christ is. And you can, you, many people will say bad things about the Lord and whatever else, um, because of your ignorance. You look at Jesus Christ and you, and you associate him with Catholicism or Protestantism or churches, organized religion, and that's wrong. But you're doing it in your ignorance. But when Jesus Christ comes physically back to the earth and he's in Jerusalem on his holy mountain there judging the world and restoring things, you're not going to speak against him then. Okay, that's what's going on there. So there is a new world coming. It's not going to be the same as the world that was here you know, when Jesus was on the earth and here today. It's going to be an all-new world at that time period. 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 through 13. The Bible says here, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Um, God has been real merciful to you, um, just as God was very merciful to me when I was a lost man, lost a professing Christian, a false convert, and God had mercy, and uh, He was long-suffering to me. He put up with a lot of things that I did were very, that were very, very wicked. And uh, he puts up a lot that you do that's very wicked. And he doesn't want you to perish. See, God's not just up there and he's just, oh, I can't wait to come down here and just wipe these little ants out, these little people, whatever. They're just like bugs to me. I'm just going to smash them. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You come to the end of yourself where you say, you know what, I'm not a good person. You know what, we can't bring in some kind of a 
world government that's going to fix the problems and whatever. And this world is in such a mess. I, I need to get to know the Creator. I want to know who made me. I want to know why I'm here. What is my purpose in life? We're not going to fix this mess up down here in this world. We're not going to be able to enlighten people and educate people and, and bring in some kind of a king. That, that, is a, that is a fairy tale. That's never going to happen. I need to know God. That's repentance. Coming to the end of yourself and saying, we're not going to do it. Only He can. Only God can. I'm a sinner. The Bible says I'm a sinner. I need to come to Him for salvation. Call out to Him and He'll save me. I can't save myself. That's what it's talking about there. Verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. And that's where we're going to end it. If you're a new ager, there are some good aspects to you. I'm thankful that you understand, if you do, uh, natural health. I'm thankful that you understand herbology. I'm thankful that you understand that the agrarian, non-big commercial plastic way uh, is the right way. I'm glad that you're against the medical establishment. Uh, I'm glad that you want to live a sustainable life. Those things are all good. Um, but if you're doing it so that you can one day save the earth and enough people can get together and we'll save the earth, we'll bring in the kingdom ourselves, um, then I have a problem with you. And the Bible has a problem with you. And God has a problem with you. Um, if you look and you say, you know what? I'm thankful. I'm thankful that... Uh, I can look at this world and I can see the things that just vex me, things that bother me. I can see how that Monsanto is destroying, uh, you know, the bees and things and, and crops. And I mean, just so much other uh, aspects of nature. It's, it's just so frustrating. And I can see how the, the water system has been destroyed down in, in many states and things, including Pennsylvania, my old home state, with the, the gas fracking. I can see how... Um, you know, the, the aquifer in the Midwest is drying up because of irrigation as a result of the Dust Bowl thing. I can see Fukushima dumping out nuclear radioactive water into the oceans. I can see this and I can see, and you can go on and on and on and on and on. And you can see the wars coming. You can see, and, and you say, it's not in my power to fix this. I know that there's going to come a new world not a new age where we're stuck with all these problems. A new world is coming when Jesus Christ comes down to the earth. I want to know Him. I want to be part of that new world. There's hope for you if you can come to that place. If you can come to the end of your own self-righteousness thinking that you're good enough to fix things and that you don't need God in your life. You come to the end of yourself and you say, okay, there's no way we're going to do this. I'm sorry. I, yeah, I'm going to still garden. I'm going to still do things. I'm going to still have organic food and try to be sustainable and try to lower my carbon footprint. But you know what? In the end, it's still going to dissolve. It's still going to be burned up. It's still going to be destroyed. doesn't mean I'm just going to go along with, you know, wrecking the earth or whatever. Uh, it just means I need to get to know my Creator. I need to walk out there into nature, into the art gallery, God's art gallery, and look around and say, what is man that thou art mindful of him? God, would you save me? Would you show me the truth, please? I'd like to be here to see that new world where everybody gets together and gets along. And uh, the animals, imagine the animals. And there's so many beautiful scriptures, you know, of, about what's going to happen in this thousand year reign of, of Jesus Christ. I want to be here for that. I want that new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. People do what's right, in other words. You want to be part of it? Or do you want to keep living in your little opium pipe dream of thinking that uh, you can 
through activism and through speaking out and through going to events and whatever else that you can bring in a kingdom on your own. Keep living in your fantasy world. It's not going to happen. There's far too many evil people in this world that are going to make sure to destroy this world. And the Lord's going to make it happen. The Lord's going to allow that thing to happen to judge those wicked people. You say, well, I don't know if I could worship a God like that. But He's given you a way out. You can get to know Him. He'll save you. You don't have to go through His judgment. So that's going to be it. I really do hope that you listen and that you take these things to mind. And, and uh, I'll link some videos here at the end uh, that you can watch and uh, on the, that you can understand what salvation is. But you got to get that thing sorted out because uh, vain is the hope of man. <laughs> um, man's not going to do it. And I know it's frustrating. I know, I know that we get frustrated. We see things happen in this beautiful area here and, and um, over this way to the north of us, there's a company called Wolfton that wants to drill into one of the mountains and inject a bunch of chemicals in there, including arsenic, to try and get metals out. And it looks like it's kind of stalled right now, that whole thing. And up that way, kind of uh, to the, will that be west? West of us, kind of northwest of us, they're trying to build a casino. Um, we see logging trucks going by here. The, the logging in this area is Irving. They log an area and then they come in and they spray glyphosate, Roundup, all over the plants and it's killing the wildlife like crazy. And, and our land that we bought here is a property that was raped by loggers and big mechanized machines come back through and they've damaged so many trees. It's going to take me years to get this forest and the, and the woodlot back healthy again. Um, it, it, it's vexing. It's vexing. But you know what? Um, I believe the Bible, and that's why I don't lose hope. I don't need drugs. I don't need alcohol. I don't need escapism uh, to say, oh man, I just want to forget about the, how bad this world is. I can accept how bad this world is because I know there's a change coming. I know judgment is coming. I pray you get things worked out. Get to know who your Creator is. His name is Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. So that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized, and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the Scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.